I learned every Prince song in the first decade of his career, and of course, every single song is a masterclass in songwriting. So I want to share with you some of the methods he used to write those songs that sounded harmonically pleasing and simple, but with a touch of unexpected advanced moments. And of course, highlight the ways he approached the guitar and how he got it to sound so damn funky. First, I'm going to share a quick overview of these nine albums and how I view the progression of his artistic development. And then I'll discuss some of the key moments that change an average expected song into an intelligently formed creative masterpiece. Prince's first album, For You, came out in 1978, catching the peak of the disco era with Saturday Night Fever having been released one year earlier, while Earth, Wind and Fire was dropping their freshest bangers, Serpentine Fire and Fantasy. This album is directly in the vein of that. The songwriting style was many chords, and very distinct sections with many more chords in each section, from verse to chorus to bridge. It was the end of the live band era, just before the drum machine when songs included band hits and section interludes. With that, every song in this album was clearly a recreation of the time. Disco funk sounds, traditional R&B ballads, and heavy power chord rock songs. His second self-titled album in 1979 was similar to the first in representing clear genres of the time. From funk to rock to traditional R&B ballads, he even tried a country-esque ballad called Still Waiting with acoustic guitar and honky-tonk piano. But now his songs became much simpler in their form and harmonic structure. Nearly every song now had only three to four chords, and that was the main groove with maybe a pre-chorus or bridge moment that diverted from the initial chord progression. And this gave birth to his first big single, I Wanna Be Your Lover, peaking at number 11 on the Billboard charts. Dirty Mind, released in 1980, was really the moment you started to hear Prince experimenting and developing his sound, both sonically with the introduction of synthesizers and drum machines, as well as in his songwriting. He injects his pop format over funky one chord vamps and introduces more gratuitous, risky themes with songs like Head and Sister. By his fourth album in 1981 titled Controversy, you get the vibe he's all in on the experimentation. He's mixing together all the genres and sounds he's been using in his first three albums. The funky grooves, straight timed rock feels, the synthesizers and drum machines providing unique tones. Also, his themes became more artistic, discussing topics beyond love, sex, and heartbreak. 1999 was Prince's first album to reach the top 10. His experimentation with the songs and the sounds he used becomes more refined. 1999 and Little Red Corvette become major hits, but a sense of experimentation still fills the record. Nearly every song is the sound of Prince. Not Prince doing disco funk or a rock song, it's the Prince sound of synthesizers, drum machines, catchy pop choruses, and funky dance grooves. At this point, Prince starts to introduce some more advanced harmonic concepts like in the song Something in the Water. And then in 1984 comes Purple Rain. The perfect balance of tones, advanced harmonic structures, and pop simplicity. The biggest hits on the album, Let's Go Crazy, When Doves Cry, and Purple Rain are all remarkably simple at first glance, but with a genius level of nuance throughout each track that makes them both accessible to the average listener as well as exceptionally above the average song. He also continues experimenting with advanced harmonies and structures, virtually heading into jazz fusion territory with songs like Computer Blue. Around the World in a Day is the follow-up to Purple Rain, and Prince takes a hard right turn, as if he's not even trying to write pop hits and only explore the boundaries of harmony and structure. Many songs are harmonically advanced and ambiguous as he plays with out-of-tune synthesizers while exploring new tones. Parade is a soundtrack to Prince's second movie, Under the Cherry Moon. I would consider it inappropriate to look at this album in context of his artistic direction because it is the soundtrack to a movie. Many tracks show Prince's interpretation of jazz, which is quite interesting and impressive, but also not meant for the pop star context in which he has become the master of. Almost expectedly, as seen throughout his career, the biggest song in the album is certainly the simplest in just a basic blues form. And the last album we'll look at is Sign of the Times, released in 1987. This album feels like the inevitable next step and balance of the harmonic exploration he took in Around the World in a Day and the tonal perfection in Purple Rain. The overall tone is dark and the advanced harmonies add to the darkness and I would argue mostly inaccessible to the average pop audience. This album doesn't have any clear pop bangers, but the sonic structure is crafted quite ingeniously. Truly an underrated masterpiece that should not be overlooked. Prince never played strictly diatonic chords. The first technique to developing a unique sounding chord progression that Prince used constantly is modal interchange, most commonly seen as borrowing chords from the relative major or minor. So if you're in the key of C major, you could take any of these chords from the key of C minor and it would give the chord progression a lift. 
a harmony that is outside of what is expected, yet still relative to the key. It can be heard in songs like Raspberry Beret, while in the key of A major, the G chord is borrowed from the key of A minor. Darling Nikki, where we borrow the flat sixth chord from the relative minor key, it gives a chord progression of all major chords such a haunting vibe. Since modal interchange can feel like it's strongly pulling us in another harmonic direction, he often uses it to introduce a bridge or another section of the song. Prince employs basically every songwriting trick in the book. When it comes to bridges, he will not shy away from the obvious moments like starting on the four chord or relative minor. And with basic modal interchange, you could start the bridge on either a flat six or a flat seven chord if you're in a major key. He also goes a step further, instead of just starting on a four chord for the bridge, he'll switch to the four chords key. In the song With You, he plays four to flat seven seven in the bridge, which is basically a one four progression in the key of the four chord. So in the key of C, the bridge goes F to B flat seven. In soft and wet, he goes to the relative minor with basically the same idea, putting a 1-4 progression in that relative minor's key. So coming from the key of A flat, we go to the relative minor, F minor for the bridge, and we go F minor to B7, which is like a 1-4 to four in the key of F minor. The perfect example of using modal interchange on a bridge and yet still clearly staying in the key is on the bridge to Take Me With You in Purple Rain. The song is in the key of A major and the bridge starts on the flat 6 chord, F. Flat 6 to 1 major is such a strong, clear bridge, but if we look deeper at this bridge, we could see that genius of Prince. Modal interchange on the bridge might be a new idea to you, but it's actually quite common. The genius of Prince is his reharmonization of the bridge. The first four bars repeat flat six to one, and the third repetition is reharmonized four sus, five sus, which would replace what we heard as the flat six chord. And as you would expect that natural cadence to resolve back to the one chord, A major, he actually resolves it on the relative minor, F sharp minor. And from there he goes back to modal interchange, resolving the bridge flat six, flat seven to one major, back in A major. Another common, beautiful songwriting trick is to use the 4 minor chord to resolve back to the 1 major. But Prince always keeps your ear guessing, and for as much as he does the obvious, he will equally do the opposite of what you'd expect. Nearly all pop songs directly resolve 4 minor to 1 major. Prince never does this. He moves the tension onward until you resolve later on down the road. In I Can Never Take the Place of Your Man, in the key of C, the chorus starts on the 4 chord F. As he ends the chorus, the classic move four to four minor is heard, but not resolved. He continues to three minor, two major, and finally a four five back to the one.
You hear a similar idea in his early song, So Blue, a jazzy progression leading to this four minor chord that makes your ear perk up, but instead of resolving, takes you down a whole three, six, two, five, one progression to get us back to the key center. And it's this playfulness and expectations where his mastery truly shines. He rarely resolves without any excitement. And a lack of excitement in this context would mean playing only diatonic chords and those chords always resolving. Are you starting to see a pattern? Everything about an intelligent, exciting piece of music is the intentional directing of expectation and surprise. Our ears are trained to expect resolution with the most common and obvious chord progressions, such as a 4-5-1, 2-5-1, or 4-1. So much of what is heard in Prince's music is the harmonic implication of resolution and not taking you there right away. And of course, that last moment to trick your listener is the ending. As the song ends, everything is leading towards a nice, comfortable resolve on the tonic, but Prince doesn't always do this. A common, unexpected ending is with the use of modal interchange. Say you're in the key of C major. So you play a four and a five chord and you would expect the one chord after that, but you play flat six, flat seven, and then one. Or you could simply choose either flat six or just flat seven and then go to one. In his earlier song, With You, in the key of C, we hear that four and that five chord telling us one or C major is coming, but he plays this. Such a unique ear-catching group of chords, flat 6 and 4 minor is borrowing from the relative minor key, and the flat 2 is a very jazzy chromatic resolve. Basically any chord can resolve chromatically up or down, and it's just a really strong jazzy feeling. The way he approached guitar was brilliant and funky to say the least. Sure he would play the expected stuff, power chords and distorted lead lines on his rock songs, R&B chords and moves on his ballads cowboy chords on his acoustic guitar, but he also played the guitar very uniquely, especially when it came to funk. The inevitable introduction to funk guitar is always James Brown. You learn the E9 chord, and you learn the funky single note pentatonic lines, but funk is in the subtle detail of the notes you pick out and how you play them. Take this minor 7 shape. In the funk context, it's really heard as an E7 sharp 9, and that dissonance is funky. He plays this idea in songs like I Want to Be Your Lover, Let's Work, and Kiss. He often adds this little move to make it funkier. And the reason that's so funky, again with adding dissonance, lowering that top note creates a tritone interval which is really nasty in all the best ways. Sticking with the idea that the nastier the sound, the funkier it is, Prince took chords and only played the nastiest parts of the chord. Take this E7 chord right here. It's a bit advanced harmonically, a four note chord. A lot of notes for a quick funky rhythm. So in songs like Controversy and Sexuality, he plays only the top two notes in the chord, highlighting this whole step interval. So much of his funkiness is actually centered around suspended seven chords. He would play seven sus shapes like these on songs like Sexy Dancer and 1999. He would add a movement to the top note like this. He would even apply the same idea to a major 7 chord, just like this. Prince would often layer funk guitar parts, and each layer would occupy a different register in the musical space. Next to those high funky chords, he would play thirds in the middle of the neck, like this. Mm -hmm. 
And you could hear ideas like this on the songs Let's Work and DMSR. Now there is a key note that sticks out to me in all of his funky guitar moves, a note that seems to be the nastiest. That would be the sixth. In the key of E major, that is the note C sharp. And what you would often hear in funk is lines highlighting the flat seven and the six kind of like this. Prince continues to highlight that note in each part of the neck. From the highs to the mids to the lows, in the key of E major, he would play something like this for the low part. When it comes to slower songs, Prince played those R&B moves tastefully, and almost as a rule of thumb, never played the one chord. At least, don't play the chord, play the move. There's really four main slides you could play over a major chord, and they're easy to locate by knowing where the E and A string roots are. So you find an A major chord on the fifth fret, see the moves around the shape, find an A major chord on the twelfth fret, and see the exact same moves around that shape. On an upbeat song like I Feel For You, he plays them very tastefully like this. Last but not least, Prince loved suspended chords. Just like in his funk, many other songs had suspended harmonies that rarely resolved. Often playing chords like this A sus2, the most beautiful example of this is his song Sometimes It Snows in April. The initial chord progression is E add 9, F sharp sus2, and A sus2. It continues on to this beautiful chorus of interesting chord changes. I barely touched on the surface of what I learned from looking at all these songs, and that's with only really looking at the chord progressions and the guitar parts. There's obviously so much more going on, but it truly is a joy to get a little bit more intimate with the genius of Prince. To sum up some of the inspiration I received from this experience, I made the Prince Packet. It organizes those funky guitar moves so you can easily add some flair to your playing, highlight some of my favorite moments in his songs that I haven't talked about, and I wrote out over 40 of his chord progressions strictly in the Nashville number system so you could only see how the chord progressions work and try out some of his brilliant ideas as you work on your own stuff. The Prince Packet is available alongside all of my great guitar courses from Introduction to Neo Soul Guitar to my Funk Guitar Masterclass at patreon.com slash nasty soul. Keep jamming and stay nasty.